Music in the city of Chicago, we are so pleased to have you join us for today's conversation. My name's Amy Eshelman. I'm the first lady, Lori's wife, of the city of Chicago. I owe, I'm never going to get used to saying that, I don't think. <laughs> Which part? <laughs> Lori and I felt it important to mark this milestone. 37 words in 1972 that changed both of our lives. The lives of many of you here today, millions of us across the country who just wanted an opportunity to get on the court, the track, the ice, the mat, the pitch, in the pool, and just to compete. As we'll hear from our panel shortly, we have come a long way in those 50 years, as is evident by the trailblazers in this room, but we still have so much work left to do. I would like to take a moment to uh, thank our amazing group of partners and sponsors. This week is a wonderful coming together of all of Chicago's major sports teams all of which have women in leadership roles. So thank you to the Chicago Bears, Chicago Blackhawks, Chicago Bulls, Chicago Cubs, Chicago Fire, Chicago Red Stars, Chicago Sky, and the Chicago White Sox. Yep, let's give them a round of applause. as well as Laura Ricketts and Brooke Skinner Ricketts, the One Chicago Fund, the Chicago Park District, <laughs> and the Chicago Public Library. Thank you for your support of this week. I'd also like to welcome our teens from the Chicago Park District's Greater Grand Crossing Summer Empowerment Camp. We are so happy that you're here. I also want to thank my friend, Melissa Isaacson, hey. author. Stand up, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> author, trailblazing journalist, assistant professor at the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern, and a member of the 1979 Niles West Champion Girls, <laughs> Illinois State Champion Girls basketball team. <laughs> you just have been such an invaluable resource to me and to our team putting this week together. So thank you so much for sharing this Title IX journey with me. Okay, so let's get the conversation started. It's my pleasure to introduce another kid like me who grew up playing sports in a small town during the early days of Title IX. My amazing wife, today's moderator, the mayor of the city of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I would be remiss if I didn't start by also thanking uh, my wife, Amy, who was also a high school basketball uh, All-American. Her high school team won the first ever girls um, state championship 45 years ago, is that right? So, <clears throat> she was a, a, a freshman first off the bench um, and made uh, remarkable lifelong uh, friendships uh, with the girls that were on that team who are now uh, women going through all the vagaries of life that we all experience. Um, but I think that that experience for her was really um, shaped a tremendous part of her life, as it has for all of us who've had um, the ability to play sports, whether individually uh, or in teams. And what we're here to talk about today is what progress we've made, but also what steps uh, are ahead on the journey um, going forward. So good afternoon. It's exciting to be here with all of you. Um, I also just want to um, give uh, tremendous thanks um, and praise to uh, today's panelists, um, who I will introduce. Um, they are, um, to my immediate uh, left, 
uh, USA Today sports columnist and commentator, uh, Christine Brennan, which does her an incredible disservice. She is one of the, I think, leading voices in sports writ large, um, but particularly um, writes incredibly thoughtful pieces about women in athletics and uses her platform uh, for good to really, I think, highlight and uplift the importance um, of the women who are out there doing remarkable things. So thank you uh, for joining us thank here you. today. Thank you. Uh, in the middle, and I feel like I'm a Bulls announcer, but in the middle, <laughs> um, joining us are uh, Chicago Blackhawks player development uh, coach Kendall Coyne uh, Shef Sheffield, who is um, and also an incredibly talented, gifted athlete, and we'll get uh, more into that today. But thank you, uh, Kendall, for being here, occupying a space that not many women um, do, particularly in a sport like hockey. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And the woman who needs really no introduction, uh, Muffet McGraw, um, for 30 plus years, uh, the head coach of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, I said it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> the Notre Dame Fighting Irish women's basketball team, which accomplished um, so many great um, things over the years, not only uh, finalist championships, but also spawned a whole tree of coaches and athletes that are achieving all over the country at tremendous levels because of uh, the dedication and work um, that uh, Coach McGraw and her team uh, did to really make Notre Dame a powerhouse of women's uh, basketball, but also influencing, I think, that great um, athletic school. Um, and my Michigan people will hate me for saying that, but <laughs> gotta give, you got to give uh, praise where praise is due. But thank you, Coach McGraw, for, for being here with us today. <clears throat> <clears throat> so let's, let's jump into um, uh, the questions, and I'm going to start with uh, uh, Christine. Uh, if you haven't seen it, folks, I highly recommend it. But she wrote, I thought, a very thoughtful uh, piece um, back in uh, late June talking about uh, Title IX and really how the pieces of the puzzle fit together. And many uh, women were highlighted uh, in that, um, including uh, Coach McGraw, which we'll talk about in a second. But talk about, um, in thinking uh, and writing that article, the last line you talked a lot about Brianna Scurry and how she was kind of an example of somebody who lived their whole life um, benefiting from uh, Title IX. And her quote was, uh, quote, uh, Title IX uh, is a seed, as a seed in the forest. And the, the point was that Title IX gave the opportunity um, to plant these seeds all over the country. And the trees that sprout are the women and the achievements uh, that are uh, that have been accomplished in the 50 years um, of this incredibly important piece of legislation. But tell us uh, what that means and how many stories you've told that have been part of those seeds that have been planted in the forest that was grown. Absolutely. Well, Madam mm -hmm. Mayor, thank you so much uh, for this honor, uh, Kendall, and of course, Muffet, to be up here with you and, and Amy and all the wonderful people that put this together. Thank you. Uh, it is a delight to come back to Chicago. I'm a Northwestern person. and. Uh, uh, on the Board of Trustees, so uh, here a lot and, and lovely to come back, and thank you. And I do believe that Title IX is the most important law in our country over the last 50 years. Now, I realize there's a lot of competition for that, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you might think I'm crazy, but I, I do believe that empowering the other 50% of our population, you know, for generations <laughs> we were telling boys they could play sports and girls, no, you can't play sports. And what were we thinking as a country? Because not only, it's of course great if you have national champions and Olympic gold medalists like we have here on the, on the stage, but it's about learning life lessons, right? All of you who played sports, and I'm guessing almost everyone in this room did, uh, you learn about winning, and even more important, you learn about losing at a young age. You learn teamwork, you, you, you learn sportsmanship. And to think we as a nation, the great United States of America said no to half of our population, you cannot learn those life lessons. Crazy. And, uh, but now we are, and those floodgates have opened, and we realized that the nation was so ready, Madam Mayor, to, to embrace this law. And we certainly saw it in the 99 Women's World Cup. I'm sure many of you remember where you were that day when Brandi Chastain <laughs> ripped off her shirt yes. after beating the Chinese uh, in penalty kicks. Rose Bowl packed to capacity, 90,000 plus for women's football, not men's football. 
Uh, I was in the press box that day. Brianna Scurry made the save that made it possible to create Brianna, uh, Brandy Chastain and her, her moment. And the nation was absolutely riveted. 40 million watched on TV. It was a minivan revolution that started from, oh, what is this soccer thing, to the entire nation is riveted. And I do think to, for the country to fall in love with women in baggy shorts and high socks, and you know, this wasn't pixies and gymnastics or figure skating, wasn't uh, necessarily even feminine, right? It was athletes. And they were 5'10 and 150 pounds, and David Letterman was calling them babes. That's another issue, except <laughs> the notion that this was cool. There's a lot of issues with that. There were a lot of issues with that. But the notion that this was cool, that this was neat, that you could aspire to this, the girls next door, uh, that, that we, we sh again, showed how the nation was, was so ready for this and falling in love with what we had created, basically halfway between these in the 50 years. 27 years in, after Richard Nixon signed Title IX in 72, 27 years is 99, and then, of course, 23 years ago. So I, I think uh, not only, of course, do blue states love Title IX, mm -hmm. but red states. Um, you know, dads are out throwing with their daughters and getting pitching coaches, and moms are too. And last thought on this, because I do think there's just, you know, we can go on forever. Um, today's 10-year-old. When she's 50, oh my God, what will the country mm -hmm. look like? And I do believe every woman that will be running for president, mayor, running the country, CEOs, university presidents, I think every single one moving into the 30s and 40s and on, when that, you know, 40 years from now when that 10 year old is 50, um, the common denominator for every single one of our women leaders in this country will be that they played sports because of Title IX. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I think it's such an important law, and I do believe today is the greatest day to be a woman or girl in sports until tomorrow, <laughs> and on and on it goes. So obviously I, I'm kind of a fan of Title IX. <laughs> so, so Coach, let me, let me um, bring you into this conversation and, and, and have you kind of sp speak to this question from the perspective of the Academy. I was reminded in <clears throat> preparing for uh, this uh, panel that the, the word activity was added in as an afterthought, and it was unclear that it was actually going to um, uh, stay in the final legislation, and obviously we're all the beneficiaries of that having happened. But talk to me a little bit about the difference that, from your perspective that Title IX has made really in the academy, because the focus in the first place was actually opening up opportunities for women in the classroom. Um, both as teachers but also as students because there was an underrepresentation of, of women in colleges and universities. So from your perspective in the, um, having spent the arc of your career um, in colleges and universities, what, is that, what has that meant for you and um, how important do you think Title IX was for opening up those opportunities? Well, you're absolutely right, Madam Mayor. It's interesting. A lot of people don't know that Title IX started because Birch Bayh, a senator from Indiana, his wife wanted to go to law school at Virginia, and she couldn't get in because they were only accepting a certain number of women or no women at all. And the word activity was tossed around, should we put it in or not? And luckily, they did put it in because now it pertains to sports. And that's been such a great thing for women of all ages, but to give us that opportunity. Uh, in 1972, there was about 20,000 women playing sports, and, and now there's 3 million. And women have learned so much from that, and Christine talked about all of the great things you learn, the life skills that you learn. But for me, for women, confidence is the biggest problem that we struggle with, and that is something that sports really can teach you all about believing in yourself and knowing that you can succeed. And yes, failure is a big part of that, and I think you learn a lot more from failure, but all of the people, uh, all the women CEOs across the country, you know, 80% of them played sports, high school or college. When you look at all of the leaders we have in our country, predominant number of them have played sports. So it's, it's a great way for women to gain that confidence, uh, to empower them, to learn those great life lessons that are gonna help you in business or whatever field you decide to get into. So it's, it's really been a phenomenal thing for women and, and I'm just so happy that we're at the point now where it's a, a normal thing for women to play sports, where back when I was playing in 1972, 
you were a little bit different. You know, it was me and nine guys down at the playground. <laughs> and it, it, you learned a lot about conflict resolution. You learned a lot of <laughs> skills that, you know, really helped you. And, and it definitely built their confidence. Right. So Kendall, um, I'm interested in you sharing with us um, what your path was to get to uh, the position that you have now. There are not a lot of women um, that are in um, senior leadership roles in, in sports, uh, men's professional sports, period, um, and especially not in hockey where you're responsible for the development of these <clears throat> seemingly younger and younger uh, male athletes that are coming into the league. So tell us a little bit about your journey and what the, the opportunities but also the challenges um, that you faced along the way. Yeah, growing up <clears throat> roughly 45 minutes southwest of here, uh, there definitely weren't many girls in the rink when I started playing. Um, and my journey in the rink started because I was a younger sibling to an older brother who was playing sports and I went to watch him play. And well over 25 years ago, uh, the girls that were in the rink were doing what I was doing, uh, watching their brother play and waiting for the moment it ended to go outside and, and defrost a little bit, or they were figure skating. Um, and so time after time of watching my brother play, I asked my parents, I, I want to do what he does, I want to play. Well, they looked a lot around the rink and they saw all the girls on one sheet figure skating and they saw all the boys on the other sheet playing hockey. And so they said, sure, you can play and they got me figure skates. Um, and <laughs> after, after a week in figure skates, I recognized I was on one sheet, Kevin, my older brother, was on the other sheet. And after a week, I said, I want to do what he does. And as I was explaining to Christine, figure skating is one of my favorite sports to watch. I've been very uh, blessed to go to the Olympic Games, and, and I am front row uh, to all of our figure skating events because I, I think it's one of the most amazing sports. But it wasn't what my brother was doing, and that's, that's what I want to do. So after a week in figure skates, uh, whatever a three-year-old can say and complain enough and cry enough, I got hockey skates. <laughs> um, and clearly, I haven't looked back since, but that's really how my journey in the game started. Um, and, and looking around the rink, there, there really weren't any other girls. Um, I was surrounded, to your, to your point, Muffet, by all boys, um, and, but didn't look at myself as any different. I looked at myself as someone who loved this sport more than anything, just like all the boys I happened to be around. Um, and then it was in 1998 when women's hockey made the inauguration into, into the Olympic Games. And I was six years old. I don't remember anything from that game, but I remember everything that happened after. And that was Kami Granado, who's from Downers Grove, Illinois. She was the captain of the, of the team. She, hold, she held a hockey camp at the Seven Bridges Ice Arena, which isn't too far from here. And my parents signed me up for the hockey camp, which was, a, which was rare because I was doing park district camps. I was doing everything but hockey in the summer. And so going to a summer camp to play hockey was a, was a very special treat. And I walked in, and there were over 100 girls hmm. at this camp. And up until this point, people were calling me names, telling me to go play sports that normal girls play, um, and, and everything in between that made me not feel very welcome in the game, but I remembered how much I love this game. And I walk into Cammie's camp and I said, see, girls do play hockey. Uh, there's over 100 of them here. Um, and from that moment on, I remember seeing Cammie's Team USA bag. I remember seeing her, her red, white, and blue gloves. I remember holding her gold medal, and that's when I turned to my parents and said, I want to go to the Olympics, and I want to win a gold medal. And there's no handbook there's to how to get there. Um, there really wasn't really many visible role models. Women's hockey still isn't as accessible as it needs to be. It's not on TV enough. Uh, but I saw Cami, and that's all I needed. It changed my life forever. And um, from there, I continued uh, to love the game, play the game, and which has led me to my, my career as a player development coach with the Chicago Blackhawks. And I think it, it takes a leader to realize, you know, maybe we haven't seen her career in the same limelight as we see our, our Blackhawks stars played night in and night out. But she has a lot that she can bring to the table. She's an asset to this organization. She can help this team win a championship. And so when it came uh, to player development and being responsible for our future Blackhawks and, and their development, they saw me as an asset. They saw me as someone who has had a lot of experience in this game, regardless if it's in the National Hockey League at the Olympic level, whatever it is. Um, they saw me as an asset for someone who can help develop our prospects. And um, going on my, my third season now, which uh, we, have, we have some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're rooting for you. We're rooting for you because you know this is a, a big uh, Blackhawks town. So I, I think one of the common themes that runs through the discussion um, so far is the importance of visibility, right? Those young girls, yourself included, 
seeing others who were doing what they were do doing, Brandy Chastain lighting the world on fire and showing this incredibly athletic body, um, and, but also getting people getting swept up uh, in that moment of incredible joy and victory. So uh, for each of you, talk to us a little bit about how important it is that that visibility happens and what it means to kind of unlock the potential of the next generation of young girls um, and athletes who see themselves on the screen and on the ice uh, in the stadiums. Why don't we start with you, Christine? Sure, sure. Well, Billie Jean <clears throat> King, who we all love, of course, yeah. and, and is a role model to everyone, uh, Billie Jean King always says, you need to see it to be it. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, I love the way Billie talks, right? I mean, <laughs> we know her well. You know, it's just like uh, perfect sound bites and little, little clips you can put on the wall or something. And it is so true. I mean, I'm sure you see this every day when mm -hmm. girls look at you and, and, uh, and boys as well and say, hey, I can be that, right? Um, and I, so I, I've always felt strongly about that personally because I never really had female role models. Muff and I are within a couple years of each other. And you know, other than watching Wimbledon, we would take a a black and white TV up to northern Michigan, we grew up in Toledo, uh, to Traverse City, uh, near, near Traverse City, and watch, I watched yeah. the Wimbledon final. And then the Olympics. And I remember watching the Olympics and thinking, this is so great. And then you talk to other women kind of our age years later, and well, I watched the Olympics too. Well, of course, there are many reasons to love the Olympics, mm -hmm. but certainly one of them was the opportunity to see female athletes. And I remember from Northbrook, Illinois, Ann Henning and Diane Hollum and the speed skaters. Mm -hmm. And my dad <laughs> said to me, I, I'm so into the, it was the 1972 Olympics in, in Sapporo, Japan, and Janet Lynn from Rockford, also mm -hmm. uh, a figure, speaking of figure skating, uh, won, the, uh, won the bronze at that Olympics. But it was the, the speed skaters. I'm watching yes. them. And I'm an athlete, um, 13 years old. And I, again, have not really seen anyone other than tennis, which, by the way, that's now the sport I'm playing and before I could get into <laughs> sports in high school. And, you know, you're seeing this and you're watching it. And I remember my dad said to me, do you want to, like, try speed skating after those Olympics ended? Because I was so sad they were over. And, you know, I kind of have a tear in my eye and my siblings, Barb, you know them well, was like, you know, Chris is crying, and my mom would say, oh, just let her cry, you know, because she's sad <laughs> that the Olympics are over. And now, by the way, do kids, do dreams come true? I've covered 20 Olympics in a row, winter and summer, for my job, all expenses paid, credential around my neck. Um, so yes, uh, dreams do come true all the time. I never forget that. And, but here I was, the speed skaters were like, my gosh, there's women athletes, right? Mm -hmm. And they're kind of our age, and so, Obviously, newsflash, I did not become a speed skater. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't move to Northbrook and, uh, or uh, West Allis uh, outside of Milwaukee. But I think that probably illustrates for me growing up that all my heroes and role models, basically, were men. We're cheering for the Detroit Tigers, Al Kaline. When I'm playing sports with the boys, which is what I always did, because there were no other girls who were allowed to play sports, and I'm almost six feet tall, so I was growing like crazy, and I, my mom and dad said, sure, honey, you can play sports. Most of the other girls were told, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. My mom and dad were giving, you know, obviously showing me the way and, and showing me that there was a place for me in sports at a time when most, unfortunately, most parents mm -hmm. were not. But it was, you know, you're a bat and you're Mickey Mantle at the plate, or you're, and this is just goofing around in, right. the, in the neighborhood, right? Or Al Kaline or whatever. And so now it gives me such great joy that you, Kendall, and, and the young women and men here, you know, the female role models that you have now in sports, we're not talking a dozen, we're talking hundreds. And that's why I am so optimistic in spite of obviously some major issues in our country right now. But I am so optimistic because, I mean, Muffet alone, alone, you probably have given the country a hundred women to cheer for, maybe more. Um, your hockey team, Kendall, my goodness, I covered your 2018 game. I didn't get it over there in 2022 in Beijing, but one of the greatest games I've ever watched was the 2018 U.S.-Canada final. U.S. won, gold medal. Um, if you haven't watched it, watch it. Find it on YouTube. Um, so again, the role models that exist yep. now, it's why I'm so obviously, obviously mm -hmm. optimistic. <laughs> so Kendall, um, what are your thoughts about that, the, the importance of being visible um, and... Um, having 
others who are the next generation being able to see you um, in the roles that you're performing? It's extremely important. I, I go back to that, that moment with Camia. Up until that point, I wore number seven. I wanted to be Chris Chelios. I wanted to play for the Blackhawks. If you look at all my youth pictures, my softball team, I'm number seven. I was number seven for everything. While I didn't change my number to 21 uh, for Cami, it was that moment that I realized, I don't want to play for the Blackhawks. I want to play for Team USA. I want to win a gold medal. I want to go to the Olympic Games. And while I feel still that I made it a little bit by being um, a part of the Blackhawks organization today, um, it was that moment of seeing Cami. And then I had a really incredible moment. Uh, I was actually with um, one of Muffet's players, I was telling her this a little earlier, in 2010, I went to the launching of the ESPNW brand. It was the summit in La Jolla, California. I was on the Futures panel um, with one of her former players, Skylar Diggins. And we were very young, and I remember sitting up there, and the keynote speaker was Billie Jean King. Uh, not to bring Billie Jean King back up, we could talk about her for days. Um, and in our gift, ba uh, gift bag when we left was her book, Pressure is a Privilege. And listening to her speak and then reading that book on my cross, my cross travel um, plane, I remember thinking to myself, so this is why I have these opportunities. She's a reason why I have these opportunities. As I was going back to high school to make a college commitment to Northeastern University to receive a full scholarship to get an education and play hockey. And it was a full circle moment for me as I'm sitting on this panel, um, you know, having the opportunity to listen to Billie Jean King speak, um, one of the, the greatest pioneers, role models, and champions of equality that, that this world has ever seen. And I'm thinking to myself, this is why I have this opportunity. She fought for so many girls like me that I wasn't even born yet. I wasn't even, you know, but so having that moment really opened my eyes to, it's now my, my job to continue to fight for the next generation, to be visible for the next generation, to continue to increase the opportunities for the next generation because there's so many women, including the women I'm on this stage with, who have fought for those opportunities for me, and I don't even know them. And the, those, this next generation, the, they are our future leaders. They are our future game changers. And so uh, to be able to be visible, to be able to share my story and maybe inspire somebody uh, through my story to, to follow their dreams just as I did mine, even if they didn't see anyone who looked like them, who came before them, that knowing that they can do it too, as long as they have a passion, they're willing to work, uh, they can accomplish anything they set their mind to. Because growing up in a sport of hockey, there, there weren't many women. Um, but at the same time, I, I knew what I loved, I knew what I wanted to do, and I wasn't going to let anyone uh, get in the way of that. And I will say there have been incredible mentors that I've had, men and women, who have helped get me to where I am today. Um, so I think that's also very important is to know that um, I want to be a mentor for the next generation because I've had so many incredible mentors, including coaches, uh, that have helped me uh, to be in the position I am in today. Thank you. So, so Coach, let me, um, let me continue this theme a little bit, but take you back to uh, 2019, and you probably know where I'm, I'm going to go. Um, after, I think it was after the uh, press conference, after the Final Four, um, you were asked a, a question that kind of triggered, I think, one of the most uh, eloquent uh, statements about the current state of, of women in leadership in general, but also uh, women in, in athletics. Um, and you talked about the fact that it was frustrating in 2019, um, obviously pre the anniversary of Title IX, that we were still talking about women in leadership as if we were all unicorns um, my word, not yours, um, and first. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, kind of where you were uh, in that moment and what your current thinking is? In 2019, I was the only female head coach at the Women's Final Four. And not only that, I was the only one with an all-female staff. And I kept getting questions about having an all-female staff. And it really was frustrating to me. But what, what kind of tipped it off was that when we got to the hotel in, in Tampa and <laughs> You know, we're just chilling, killing time, and I turn on the TV, and the, my TV says, welcome, Matt McGraw. So my husband got a great welcome at the Women's Final Four, and uh, I was, I was, you know, that was just kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. So when the question came, I was ready. Um, because for me, I look at men's sports. 99% of coaches of all men's sports are men. So why shouldn't 99% of all the coaches in women's sports be women? In 1972, 90% of the coaches of women's sports were women. But here we are 50 years later, and just 40% of the coaches of women's sports are women. 
it's still an anomaly. We have our first female vice president. We have our first African-American mayor of a big city. We have so many firsts. Every time you turn around, it's like, oh, the first woman to be in the NHL, the first woman who has done this. And I'm tired of being the first. I want it to be normal. I want it to be something that happens all the time so that we're not surprised when a woman does something great. And when you're young and you're looking up at whatever your career is going to be, whether you want to be in Hollywood or politics or business or sports, it helps to see somebody that looks like you. Because if you don't see somebody that looks like you, your role models, like ours, are all going to, to be men. So we need to have more women front and center. There's so many women that have done great things in history, and we never learn about them in school. That's why we have to have Women's History Month. We have to jam it all into one month. Because we don't <laughs> teach them about what happened in our history. And there's so many women that have been so successful. And we have such a long way to go. We have so far to go in every field. Every field that you work in is a male-dominated field. And it's a white man male-dominated field. And that's the problem with coaches. White men making the decisions because people hire people who look like them. We need more people that have a diverse background in sports, in politics, in everything. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't think you're going to get much of disagreement from anybody up here, <laughs> no. and I don't think uh, uh, from the audience. So let's talk about that, right? Obviously, a lot has been achieved um, over the arc of these 50 years, um, as we've highlighted both um, uh, things from personal experience, but also uh, in general. But what's the next frontier? What do you see as um, the most immediate challenge that we've all got to take on and be united on to be able to continue to make sure that Title IX has resonance uh, and growth um, and, and opens up more opportunities uh, for women and girls in, in sports. Um, Kendall, you want to jump in first? Well, I think we, we can't be satisfied with what the last 50 years have brought us. We need to continue to push. And I think the, the opportunities that exist for, for women in sport is not nearly enough. I think the resources that women in sport are provided are, are not enough. Um, I can speak in, in, in terms of hockey. Um, you know, when you have the opportunity to play in the NCAA, you play di whether you play Division One, College, Division Two, II, Division Three, whatever it is. Uh, but as soon as you walk across that stage, it's it's one of the greatest days being able to get a college education and uh, play sports in college. But then the reality is there's there's not a professional league that allows you to be professional. Uh, you must get a job in something else if you want to continue your hobby what, of what it becomes at that time mm -hmm. of, of playing hockey. And so to continue to, while Title IX has impacted, uh, you know, the, the college sports in such a, in such a, a great way, um, it, we need it to continue to transcend beyond the NCAA level. And, and we need to look at um, the equity standards in, in women's professional sports as well, because there's such a long way to go. And I think going, going back to the visibility piece um, for a lot, for women's hockey, everyone talks about the Olympics. And for us, it's not every four years, it's every day. The work is every single day. It's not every four years when you see us, but that's the only time you see us. So when we talk about how do we, you know, Christine does an incredible job, but how do we increase the media coverage of, of women's sports? How do we talk about women's sports more? How do we talk about the athlete more? Not just, oh, she looks great in this or that or whatever it is. It's how do we talk about the athlete like we see in men's sports on a regular basis? When you turn on the TV, how often are you seeing women's sports versus men's sports? There's such a, there's such a long way to go, um, but you know, women's sports need to continue to be top of mind when it comes to not only the conversation, but the resources um, that, are, that are given to women's sports. Well, you, you, your, your point is, I think, uh, particularly timely. When we think about the, the challenge that now is, I think, played out on a daily basis regarding repatriating uh, Brittany Griner uh, to the US, it raises a question I think of, well, why do the women go and play overseas um, in the, their off season, uh, the normal time that folks play basketball? It's because they can't get the income here in the United States. And then why not? Right? So I, think, I hope that one of the things that comes out of this terrible um, uh, crisis that has been created by the Russian government um, it's not only we bring Brittany back, but we start talking about what needs to happen to make sure these incredibly gifted athletes don't have to travel um, to far-flung places in the world to be able to um, play their sport and earn a living uh, without having to compromise essentially their whole life um, in pursuit of their dreams. Um, Christine, 
you obviously come at this question of what's the next most immediate steps from a lot of different perspectives, because you talk to folks all across the country um, in a lot of different sports and obviously have had um, decades of, of opportunity to reflect on this. What are you seeing as kind of the most immediate steps that need to be taken to push Title IX into the next uh, generation? Well, first of all, I completely agree with you about Brittany Griner, and this is, you know, it's just awful. Um, I've said against the backdrop, of course, of the, Ukra of the Russia yeah. horrors in Ukraine. Um, but if there is something good, especially when she gets back, obviously, yeah. and, and they'll, she will get back, but if, how many more months does she have to endure six foot nine in a cage? It's, you know, it's just awful. Um, but hopefully it is shining that light that you just described uh, about she's there because, as Muffet knows so well, Kendall too, <laughs> there's, there's not enough money. The, well, the, here, here's, the, here's the numbers. Um, the, aver the highest salary in the WNBA is 228000 a year. With bonuses and things, you can maybe get up to a half million. That's just a, a rare couple athletes. Um, the NBA, the highest salary is 48 million. 48 million for Steph Curry and 228,000. It's right, but that's also capitalism, which means we need to buy tickets, mm -hmm. right? You need to support it, you need to turn it on, you need to let everyone know that you care about this. Uh, as far as the future, I think building off what Kendall said, two things I see, uh, and actually building off what Muffet said. Women, we need to focus in the, the next 50 years of Title IX on women coaching women. And, you said it beautifully. In fact, you, I felt like I was back in that press conference. You had the exact same energy. It was fantastic. Um, and if you haven't watched it, watch it. It's, what, two and a half minutes? Spectacular. Um, the, I, we need, we absolutely have to, and, and you know, I'll get pushed back if I talk about this, write about it, mm -hmm. you know, on Twitter. Oh, well, that's a quota, right? You, you know, shouldn't it be the best person? Well, first of all, the best person's probably a woman, Who's, who has not been allowed to get the job because, as you mentioned, the male athletic directors, like 90-some percent right, of athletic directors are men, are hiring people who look like them. So we, we know that that, you know, take that and throw that out the window. But also, even if it is the step up, the nudge up, right, to, to give them a chance, do it. Um, we love Joe McEwen at Northwestern University. He's the women's basketball coach at Northwestern. We've had women coaches at Northwestern. Um, Joe is a friend. I love him. You know Joe very well. Philly, right? Your Philly connection. When Joe is finished, and I, others have said this, not just me, when Joe is finished, Northwestern must hire a woman. Mm -hmm. For us, where we care so much about Title IX and led the way in the Big Ten back in the 70s, when Michigan and Ohio State couldn't have cared less about women playing sports, <laughs> we did, and Iowa did, Missy. Um, you know, that's, we have to do that, and we, every university should be thinking that. And the other thing that has to be done, we've nailed the suburbs, Madam Mayor. We have got the white kids and the well-off kids, yes. whatever color they are, playing soccer and volleyball and basketball. We've nailed it. Mm -hmm. We've absolutely nailed it. But how is it possible that the U.S. women's national soccer team has four or five women of color right. on a team of 20 to 23 people, right? That's just absolutely should be unacceptable. It should be basically probably 50-50. It should look more like our women's basketball team, right? And it doesn't. And what that means is we have failed uh, in urban areas, the underserved urban, uh, underserved urban and underserved rural areas where Title IX has not yet been able to work yeah. its magic. So. So, so I have a couple of stats on that. The 30% of college athletes are white women um, compared to only 14% that are women of color. And if you think about that, and you think about what's happening in urban centers all across the country, Chicago being one of them, and the incredible talent that I see on a regular basis, something's wrong. And that is absolutely something that's gotta be fixed. Um, Coach, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll preface it because uh, um, I, can, I can say this, I think, from where I am. The NCAA, to me, is fundamentally broken when it comes to women athletics. Um, obviously, we saw, I think it was a year ago or two years ago, again, during um, the women's uh, um, basketball tur tournament, um, the absolutely deplorable uh, resources that are available for them in terms of uh, locker rooms, weight rooms, and, and so forth. 
how, how is it possible that in this late stage that that disparity existed? And, and I won't ask you to comment on the response of the NCAA. I'll just say it was absolutely embarrassing. Um, but how, how do we change that? Well, you change it with leadership. I mean, there's a cosmic fail of leadership at the top of the NCA. There was nobody looking out for women. They don't value women. All of their rules and regulations and their guidelines when they talked about this is how we feel about gender equity and inclusivity, they, they broke all their own rules. So they, they have really nothing to stand on. And they still have not promoted the woman's vice president of basketball to report directly to the president where she reports directly to the men's vice president of basketball, which is our fundamental problem. <laughs> and I think the biggest problem that we have really looking to the future is just in our society. We expect women and girls are gonna act a certain way. We ascribe these attributes to them. You know, I have a question for you boys over there. How many of you think that women are your equal? How many times when you go out and you're playing a game or playing a sport or in class and you're going like, hmm, I'm not gonna get beat by a girl. Right? I I'm, mean, see, I'm seeing a little bit of blush uh, <laughs> on the cheeks there. But there's a couple of hands. <laughs> and, and having careers in, in uh, science and math and, and technology, you know, we, we need to do so many more of those things. But at the NCAA level, they, they, we need to hire a woman is what we need to do. We need to hire a woman at the top so that we can look and see how our, prog our programs are valued. They don't promote us. We got 4% of media attention on ESPN. When you turn on SportsCenter, you're not going to see anything about women. You have to really dig to find information about the women. And those are some of the things that they need to fix at that level because people are seeing that and they're saying, well, that's just how it is. You know, if you want to look up and see anything in, in men's, I mean, everybody talks about that, but it's the women's. But I think it's our society. You know, you, you go in Target to buy a birthday present, you're going to be in the pink aisle or you're going to be in the blue aisle. <laughs> and we're, we're like, we're forced into those yeah. roles. And you guys, right. you need to break that. You're the ones, this next generation, I think, is where the future is going to change. Thank you. <laughs> and <they're> happy for you. <laughs> so let's, let's go back to the, uh, the issue of uh, girls of color, young women of color uh, participating um, in sports, um, how do we fix that? Because there's, you see it at the urban level, but you're not seeing it at the next level, and you're certainly not seeing enough of it across um, every single sport. So when we talk about diversity and inclusion, to me, that's one of the biggest um, challenges uh, that we have. But again, it's, to me, it's about opening up opportunity. I don't know, Kemble, if you have uh, a thought about that. Yeah, I do. Uh, hockey's one of the whitest sports that there is. And um, it, you talk about the makeup of the Olympic team. Um, we had our first indigenous, indigenous player um, on this 2022 team. We've, we've never had um, a, a person of color on our Olympic team um, to date. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at those stats, when you look at the makeup of, of our team, um, the game is is not inclusive enough, it is not diverse enough. We are not attracting this sport to everybody. The, the rinks need to fee, feel more welcoming. The rinks need to be more diverse. So when you walk in the rink, you see that you, you are represented in the rink, whether that's in coaching, that's officiating, that's in playing, that's in the, the makeup of the teams. Um, how do we make the sport of hockey um, more inclusive? I think we, we have, I would say, arguably the longest way to go in terms of, of a sport in the United States. Um, and it, it needs to change. And I think um, our work with the looking at one of my coworkers, but one of our work with the Blackhawks, um, I think we do we are, we're doing a lot of great things um, to make sure we're introducing uh, the sport to, to everybody and making sure that when you walk in the rink, you you do feel welcome. Um, Can you talk a little a little bit about that? I know a little bit, but I think it'd be interesting for the the audience to hear it. Yeah, so we do a lot of a lot of youth hockey programs, whether that's First Stride. Um, we do the Goal program at the Chicago Public Schools, which stands for Get Out and Learn, which I love. Be Pre-COVID, I was in the schools. Um, we were we were teaching um, hockey. We have nets, we have pennies, we have balls, we have sticks, um, and we're we're playing floor hockey, introducing the game. Uh, most recently, uh, we were introducing hockey to the teachers uh, at the Boys and Girls Club, and then we are going to be getting the students on the ice. And then uh, the plan is to get them to a Blackhawks game. If anyone's in here, I don't know if that's a surprise. I'm sorry if I ruined it. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it's not just it's not just 
handing, handing a kid a stick, it's, it's handing them a stick with a plan to help them continue to stay involved in this game beyond just the introduction of this game and making sure that when they walk into a rink they feel that this is a place for me, this is a safe place that I can, I can grow, I can learn, that someone has my back, that I, I, I belong here. Um, it, it, just as a woman in hockey, um, I, f I have felt some of those um, struggles at times where you look around and you're like, no one here looks like me. Am mm -hmm. I supposed to be here? And mm -hmm. it's not a good feeling. And I'm sure a lot of people in this room have had similar feelings, um, whether it's, it's gender, it's race, it, it's, it's something else. It's, you feel it and it's not a great feeling. So it's making sure that the work that we do in the community um, is introducing the game and making sure that this game is, is known that it is for everyone when you walk into a rink or you, you walk into a court or you, you put on rollerblades and you grab that stick for the first time, you know that you, this sport can be with you for the rest of your life. So, so let me, let me uh, pick up on one of the things that you just shared, which I think is an important one. Um, and whether you're playing sports or not, women are still going into spaces built by and for men. And until we get that right and build institutions that reflect the reality of women's uh, lives, and one for one of which is we continue to be the primary caretakers of our uh, children. But, but how did you, um, and what advice would you give for the young athletes that are here in the audience, how do you overcome that feeling like, hey, should I be here? Because I think that's a pervasive problem for women in general. Coach McGraw, I think, really hit the nail on the head. We are socialized to believe that we should deserve less or that we shouldn't be in certain spaces. And each of us have had to overcome that in one way or the other. And I'll um, ask the, the other two to join in. But for you as, um, as an athlete, how, do you, how did you overcome being in what is traditionally a male-dominated sport but feeling like, I deserve to be here because the psychology, right, effect is going to translate into whether or not you're going to be able to perform and use those incredible athletic talents. If you're not here and feeling comfortable, it's not going to, you're not going to be able to translate it into your athletic prowess. It's two things, and I'm <laughs> trying to look at the kids. It's my love and my passion. If you love something and you're passionate about it, don't let anyone take that away from you. Don't let anyone tell you you don't belong. Don't let, don't let anyone disintegrate that love and that passion that you have something that's so burning you wake up every day and you're like I want to do that I love that I want to do it I want to pick up a hockey stick whatever it is for me that was that was every day I wanted I wanted to play hockey I wanted to to be shooting pucks um, at my parent my mom's not happy but at the walls in my basement and um, <laughs> uh, but that was you know that's what I leaned on when I walked out of the rink or there were boys pulling my hair calling me a tomboy parents saying, why are you signing your daughter up for hockey to my parents when I'm hearing them getting cut from teams because coaches said, I don't want a girl, on, we don't want a girl on our team. That's going to cause problems in the locker room. It's all of these things that could have led to me quitting the sport. But when I got in that 200 by 85 box, that's the size of an ice rink. Uh, when I got inside that, on that ice sheet, I didn't care what anyone had to say. I loved being here. This is where I was, this is where I belonged. And for me, it was my love and my passion. And I still have that same love and that same passion because I wouldn't be able to continue to do what I, what I do today because I will tell you, I walk into a rink you know, in my job and, and every single coach is a male. Uh, to Muffet's point, we, we, need, we need more women. But I will say the men that I am surrounded by, the Chicago Blackhawks, they want me to succeed. They, they have my back. They, if I have a question, I'm not afraid to ask. Um, and so even when I was a kid, it was, it, and I, I had... Um, all male coaches um, as a kid there were certain coaches that I knew they they knew I knew they they knew I loved the sport I wanted to get better at the sport they cared about me as another player on the team not as the only girl on the team or oh we got to treat her differently because she's a girl uh, no they saw me as an equal they saw me as as just another player on the team and I, I could feel that I, I leaned on those coaches those mentors those people that wanted to see me succeed and I tuned out all the naysayers I tuned out the people uh, that you know had negative things to say and it's so funny because I'm sure you guys have experienced this. They all come back around at some point, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Coach, you just heard, I think, um, very powerful uh, testimony from the perspective of the athlete. You've seen it from the perspective of a coach. What advice have you given uh, athletes over the years um, to help them overcome those self-doubts, those psychological barriers uh, that prevent them from being able to um, really be um, embrace their incredible athletic talent? I think building confidence is my primary job, but I, I would tell my girls, sometimes you have to care a little bit less about what other people think. Mm -hmm. 
you have to have a circle that you trust. And I always get the girls together in the beginning of the season. I say, look around this circle. These are the only people whose opinions I care about. I don't care what the media is saying. No offense, Christine. I don't care what anybody else is saying. I don't care what your parents are saying. This is the group that we're going to go with. And so you have to believe, because you have that passion and that love for the game, and you want to be there. But I think it's, uh, especially girls, and, and maybe everybody does this, but we just, we just are so sensitive to what other people think. And I just feel like, you know what, I, if I don't respect you, then I don't really care what you think. And I am a lot more like a man that way. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me ask one other question of Christine, um, and then I'm gonna um, call on a couple of members of the audience who have some questions. So you've had the great gift, I think, of, of bearing witness to a lot of phenomenal athletes um, over the years. Same question, but from your vantage point, what have you seen as kind of the secret sauce that they have used to get themselves comfortable in spaces that traditionally women haven't been in? Yeah, well, it's a, it is really not only a great question for today, but it is a great question for the next X number of, of decades. And I think what both of uh, Kendall and Muffet have talked about, confidence, you know, that they they were like shot out of a cannon, right? I was launched, you know, out of Northwestern to my wonderful, and out of my home in Toledo before that. And so I think, you know, if you've got the backing, if you've got the coaching, if you know you belong or you feel like you belong, then those steps are easier as mm -hmm. you start to do it. One thought that I'd like to, just a, a quick thought on the same question, Madam Mayor, but just to turn it a little bit. As we get the pushback still from men, right? As the NCA, your point, still a man. As we still deal with these things we've been dealing with for decades. We talked about this actually at lunch before we came up here, that the, what is the growth industry for every one of these sports, men's, women's sports, the NFL, NBA, WNBA, everything, it's women. Hmm. And uh, we shouldn't have to make it about capitalism and about profit. But if it takes that to wake some of these people up, people, men, mm -hmm. up in these leaders, I mean, that I think has been one of the keys in the NFL. First of all, they do now have some assistant coaches, mm -hmm. quite a few, mm -hmm. uh, women referees, huge, right? I would hope someday maybe we'll see a woman place kicker in the NFL, obviously, you know, we'll see how that goes. But the NFL is for fan base, 45% is women. So when the domestic violence issues hit and they're awful and they're terrible and have they been handled properly? No. And does the NFL have to do a lot more work on that? Yes. Mm -hmm. But they, in the back of their minds, it should be in the front, they have to say, my gosh, half of our fans are women. Now, it should be an issue that men care about yes. too. Yes. But, but um, I do think that over these next decades, one of these major issues is that well, golf, for example, you talked about spaces for, for, for athletes. Golf is, is dying hmm. demographically, and they need women desperately, and they put up a stop sign at Augusta National, all these other places for decades, no women allowed. Mm -hmm. And now they, all these Title IX women, like Kendall and so many, just you know, hundreds of thousands being pumped into our country, millions every year, not necessarily Olympic gold medalists, or college scholarship athletes, but just great women who've learned these life lessons who are gonna have disposable income for the rest of their lives, and they're gonna spend money, and golf would be perfect, and yet golf has turned them away, and now golf realizes, hence Augusta National mm -hmm. Women. So looking at golf, you can see that they're starting to realize, oh my gosh, we blew it. We haven't done a good job on attracting women, and now they're trying to catch up. Probably too late for the game of golf, uh, and I love golf, but I think it's way too late because women are doing marathons and half marathons, mm -hmm. et cetera. But mm -hmm. that money part piece of it really may mm -hmm. be the key. Unfortunately, it should be other reasons too. But anyway, it's a thought. So we have 50 teens from the Chicago Park District Empowerment Camps uh, who are here. And we have some questions uh, in particular from the teens from the Grand Crossing Park District Camp. So I'm going to call upon you. I think you know who you are. So when I call upon you, why don't you stand up, um, tell us who you are, tell us uh, what school you go to, um, and then I'll have you ask your questions. How's that? So first up, you ready? Tyann Hodges. Tyann, are you here? There you go. All right. And, and Tyann, we're going to make sure that you 
not only play basketball, volleyball, but you also run track. Um, <laughs> you, you look like uh, our daughter at 14. Um, so your question was what? It's for you, actually. Okay. My question is, what was your favorite sport as a kid? Hmm. So I grew up in a little town uh, in Ohio where um, everybody was focused on football. So my high school football team um, had one of the first uh, professional uh, sports teams uh, in that later became part of the, of the NFL. Um, a, a founding coach uh, was Paul Brown who um, founded the Cleveland Browns and then later uh, the Cincinnati Bengals. So my great love is, uh, is football. But the sport I played um, most obsessively when I was a kid was softball. Um, I love basketball, um, but I was absolutely obsessed with playing uh, softball. I played every summer, um, starting when I was about uh, fourth grade, and I played it until I was in my 30s um, here in Chicago. So thanks for your question. I appreciate it. Um, next up is uh, Belen Das. Balen Das. Balen Das. Here you go, Balen. What's your question? And okay, my question? question is for Muffet McGraw. I have a question. Um, what made you want to be a coach? You know, I think mostly because I stopped playing and I was like, dang, that's the end. Um, <laughs> what, do I, what do I do now? I was a sociology major. I was going to save the world. I didn't have any idea. Um, and I, I decided to try coaching high school. So I coached high school. And from my first practice, I was like, this is it. I have found my passion and my love for the game because I, I just I loved it and I wanted to really felt important to empower women. So that was that was part of it, too. Thank you for your Thank question. You. You're welcome. Uh, next up is uh, Daria Jackson. Did she hear? All right, you, got, you, you get to ask whatever you'd like. Just tell us who you're asking to. And um, I'm asking my question to Kendall. And my question is, what is your favorite thing about your job? Uh, my favorite thing about my job is helping uh, someone else accomplish their dreams and achieve their goals. Um, and with our prospects, their goal is to play for the Chicago Blackhawks one day, and they have not yet achieved that goal. So just being a part of that process and helping instill, whether it's confidence, belief, skill set. Um, and the other part I'd say is it's, it's different every day, whether I'm traveling, I'm, I'm not in an office every day, so I'm kind of, I'm always out and about, and I'm a, I like to be on the move kind of person. So I would say those two things. Great question. Thank you for your question. You must be Chanel Smith. No? <laughs> You're up. You have the microphone. Tell us who you are and uh, ask your question. My name is Ivy, and my question is for um, Christine. <laughs> Christine and <laughs> Christina. And what my question is, what is your favorite sports story you reported? Ooh, great great question. That's a great question, Ivy, and thank you for the question. And um, I am very lucky to have been able to cover a lot of stories, and I've loved them all. I really, uh, I'm so fortunate. Um, I would say something at the Olympics, certainly, because that was always what I loved as a girl growing up, and now I get to cover the Olympics. Um, love covering you guys in 2018, <laughs> but um, I think the story to end all stories for me, and you, by the way, you never know when the big moment's gonna happen in your careers or your lives, when you're just going along, and then something happens, and it changes everything in a, a great way. And for me, it was January 6, 1994, in Detroit. I was covering the figure skating, which of course is a sport mm. Kendall started out in, a sport I've written books about, covering the figure skating national championships with the Olympic trials for the Lillehammer Olympics in 1994. And someone attacked the knee of Nancy Kerrigan. And that story, you can go up, when you go home, you can Google this. I know you're laughing, you're ready for it, because it was, it was serious that her knee was hit, except they missed, thankfully, because it was a game that couldn't shoot straight. And it was the bruised knee, it was the most famous bruised knee in sports history, it spurred Nancy Kerrigan on to the greatest performance of her life. It's called the Tanya Nancy Saga, covered it every day from January 6th to the end of February in Norway. 
And it was a story that you could kind of giggle about because once Nancy was healthy, it was just the craziest, weirdest, bizarre story ever. And I'll leave it at that. The adults and the older people <laughs> oh, know. We all know. But it, what it did, this goofy story allowed me to write books and go on television for the first time and completely changed my life. I never in a million years would think a figure skater would change my course of my career. But it happened, so you never know what's going to be the thing that changes yours. Thank you. That's a great, <laughs> That's a great question. So thank you, Ivy, for your question, and thank all of you. Um, we are at time, so I will uh, wind it down with a few last words. Um, first of all, ladies, thank you so much for um, your generosity uh, in being here, but also the conversation, which was uh, very rich and I think we'll be dissecting for, uh, for some time. But for those of you in the audience, um, 50 years for many of you seems like an eternity because you're just at the beginning um, of your life. Um, but a lot of people fought hard for a long time to make sure that each and every one of you had the kind of opportunity where you didn't have to think about, I'm a girl and can I do it? Um, all of us, um, probably not Kendall, are old enough to remember <laughs> that was a real thing, right? That we couldn't get to play um, and do other opportunities. We had to stop and think, do girls do that? I hope that none of you have to have that experience uh, in your lifetime. But as we talked about, there's still many more um, uh, steps in our journey to make sure that there's truly equal opportunity uh, for all. But the stories that you heard today, and if you um, find out a little bit more, which I encourage you to do, about each and every one of our panelists, you're gonna know that they were incredible trailblazers in their own right, um, that they have done tremendous things, not only uh, in their sports, in their craft, um, but to really advance women's equity uh, writ large because of the way in which they have lived their values every single day. So I just want to say thank you. Um, learn more about, about Title IX and its importance. Uh, and thank you again, uh, First Lady Amy Eshelman um, and the team uh, for making sure that this week was something that we remembered and celebrated in the city of Chicago. Thank you all very much. Thank you.